Hello, my name is Cody Price and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 o'clock, so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today on April 8th, we'll have a presentation on ethics, a framework for decision making given by Susan Elks and Steve Gimble. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of our participating chapters, divisions, and university and I want to send a personal thank you out to the Pennsylvania chapter for sponsoring today's session. Here's a list of our upcoming webcasts. As you can see, our next one will be um, next Friday on April 15th, Campus Planning for Pedestrians and Bicyclists. Um, I want to point out a few pointers. Uh, the one on May 10th, the Revitalized Chesapeake Bay Rest Restoration Program. Um, this is still in the process of being uploaded to the website, so this will be up um, in a few days, and so be sure to look, at, look out for that if you're interested. And also, we just added the June 24th, June 3rd and June 24th webinars. So if you are interested in those, you can find um, those listed at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast, and you can register for your webcast of choice. And you'll also be able to find a complete listing for 2011. Um, at the conclusion of the webinar, you'll be able to log your CM credits. How you'll do so is by going to www.planning.org slash CM. Select activities by date, and then underneath uh, Friday, April 8th, you'll select Ethics, a framework for decision making. And this is up, and it's also um, eligible for one and a half CM credits, so you'll be able to claim those as well. We are also recording today's session, so you'll be able to find a video recording and a PDF of today's session at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast dash archive, and this should be up by Monday. At this time, I would now like to hand it over to Susan Elks, who will be introducing our speakers for today. Thank you, Cody. Thank you to the attendees for joining us today. My name is Susan Elks. I'm the Professional Development Officer for the Pennsylvania Chapter of APA. I'm also a Community Planner with the Chester County Planning Commission here in Pennsylvania. Joining me today is Dr. Steve Gimble, and he is the Chair of the Department of Philosophy in Gettysburg College here in Pennsylvania. Today we're going to break things up a little bit. I'm going to briefly provide an overview of the AICP Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct um, and then turn things over to Steve Gimble for a primer on moral deliberation. Then we're going to have a couple of scenarios where we will be polling the audience um, to get your feedback on two scenarios that um, probably are fairly common, I would say, out in the planning world, and then we're going to have some focused discussion on those scenarios. And then at the end, we do have um, a few resources to pass along to everyone. So just to give you this overview on the, the Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct, uh, one thing I do want to point out that you may not be aware of is that it was revised in October of 2009. That revision was specifically Rule 26 and Section D, which I'll discuss later. Prior to that, the code itself overall had been adopted and made effective in 2005. There are four main parts to the code, A, B, C, and D. A are the principles to which we aspire, B, the rules of conduct, C, the procedures, and then D is this new section, planners convicted of a serious crime um, and automatic suspension of certification. That code, the full code, is available on the APA website. It's only about eight pages long. If you have not ever looked at it, certainly do so. Um, download it uh, and, and take a read. It's not that long of a read. A little bit more detail on each section, the principles to which we aspire. There are some key areas in here, and when I look at this list, basically, I think, well, yeah, this is part of why I decided planning was a good career. 
uh, we have a responsibility to the public um, and specifically our primary obligation should be to serve the public interest. As part of that we should always be focused on public involvement and always be sharing accurate information. Those are the types of things discussed um, in this section of the principles. They also talk about a planner's responsibility to their clients and to their employers. And one of the key phrases in there that I have always thought of is independent professional judgment. Whether you're serving your client, your employer, you know, whatever the situation, you always need to go back to your independent professional judgment and use that as one of your guiding forces, essentially. The third section is our responsibility to our profession and colleagues. This focuses on education and research and professional development. Basically, um, always be trying to better yourself and be sharing that not only within the profession but beyond that. And the principles to which we aspire. This is uh, what you would kind of call the hazy part of the code. Um, if you violate this portion of the code, you can't get in trouble for it, essentially. There's no sanctions. There's nothing of that nature. Um, as this little cartoon shows, um, this is the part where, you know, you can draw it on the Etch-a-Sketch and shake it up a little bit because it's not a hard and fast black and white type of thing, these principles to which we aspire. One of the key principles that to point out um, is A1H, which discusses dealing fairly with all participants in the planning process. Um, and it specifically notes public officials or employees um, and dealing even-handedly with all process participants. Another key principle is this conflict of interest or even the appearance of a conflict of interest. And the third principle um, that I think is important is this one that just notes that we definitely should be always working on our education and training to help us in our jobs. Uh, CM is part of this process, um, but any training overall is part of this. The rules of conduct, these are 25 very specific rules. Uh, there are some general topics that keep reoccurring in these 26 rules. Conflict of interest turns up in more than one rule. Accurate information turns up more than one time. <clears throat> And the code procedures themselves appear in more than one, one rule. This is the part that you need to worry about, essentially. Um, if you think you're starting to get in an area where you're uncomfortable, um, breaking a rule of conduct, can you get, get you sanctioned? Um, it can get you removed from AICP or sanctioned in some other form. So the take-home point from this is, you know, 25 out of 26 rules is not passing, just like 7 out of 10 commandments is not passing. And I have several rules here highlighted. Um, like I said, there's 26. I'm not at all going to go through them all, um, but I do have a few here. This one, I think rule number one, I think it's a, it's a reason it's rule number one. It's talking about accurate information. It is really the starting point in doing any type of planning process that you need um, to be providing accurate information on the planning issues that you're going to be discussing. A few of the rules, there's definitely kind of the public rule and then the private sector rule. And rules five and six are an example of this. Five directly discusses public officials or employees and compensation. And, and what you should or should not be doing there. And then rule number six is basically the equivalent for a private sector employee. Um, and you can see that the private sector side is a little looser, um, you know, focusing more on written disclosure from your boss rather than just absolutely don't do it. Openness is definitely the key um, in either of these, particularly with um, the private sector where a little bit more is permissible. permissible. Uh, rules 8 and 9 are similar again in that 
the one role is, is public officials and the other one is more directed to the private sector. But again, covering the same basic topic. You know, planning is to be an open public involvement process. It's not to be backroom discussions and decision making. And both of these rules essentially address that, um, that desire for openness. Another thing to keep in mind with these, um, in addition to what the AICP has to say about this, you know, of course, there are local, um, whether it's at your, your agency um, or your state, there are local rules, procedures, or customs that um, typically have something to say about this. And APA wants you to be following those as well. Um, rule number 13 is, is fairly straightforward, but, you know, don't be trying to say that you can do something or can get something or can, you know, um, in an improper manner. Improper influence is, is not the way they want things to be done. Moving on to the code procedures, which are the third section of um, the Code of Conduct. Um, the charge of misconduct section is very standard, I would say, really. You know, if you know anything about um, the U.S. justice system, this kind of works in the same manner. You know, someone files charges and it gets investigated and um, there's a variety of ways that things can be handled from that point forward. Um, so that is pretty straightforward. What is a little bit different about this is the informal advice and the formal advice. Basically, if you are in a situation where you're starting to wonder that something might be wrong, um, you can go to APA and ask for advice. Specifically, you would go to the ethics officer, which is always the executive officer of APA and AICP. Right now, that would be Paul Farmer. You know, you can contact APA and, and, and find the ethics officer. You can check the website um, and come up with them. The informal advice is not in writing. Uh, the formal advice is written. So those are just avenues that you have basically available to you if you think, you know, you're starting down a road or you think someone else has started down a road, um, that's a problem. You can seek advice before anyone gets to the point of um, misconduct. Section D, like I said, that's the 2009 revision and it's the last part of the code. It defines a serious crime and it discusses the process that's related um, if someone is convicted of a serious crime. And that's you automatically get suspension of your AICP. Um, you have to notify AICP. You can petition for reinstatement. Um, and then, you know, it's going to depend on, on the exact situation. But automatically, um, it's a suspension of your AICP. And this was, like I said, a new, um, a new revision in 2009. I don't know what brought that about. One would think something specifically did, but um, I, I really don't know about that. I'm going to turn things over now to Steve Gimbel. He is chair of the Department of Philosophy at Gettysburg College. Um, he has presented on this topic before for the PA chapter and the audience was very appreciative of his um, presentation previously, so we thought we would bring this to a larger audience for everyone. In addition to his classes and research, he does present on workplace ethics um, to a variety of professional organizations. And I'll pass that off to him now. Well, thank you, Susan. It's absolutely wonderful to be here with everybody. So what I want to give to you now is a, a quick primer on moral deliberation, right? How is it that we go about thinking about hard ethical questions, right? Because we do think about them, right? On the one hand, it certainly seems as if, well, look, we react from the gut. And to some degree, that's probably right. But when we come across a hard moral problem, what we often do is we sit and we meditate on it. We think about it. We deliberate. And what I want to do now is discuss the means of deliberation. How is it that we go about thinking about it? Because we don't often think about the way we think about things. But if we're a little bit clearer than we normally are on how we go about thinking about things, we can understand how to approach a number of different problems. Now, it's a wonderful thing that planners have the code of conduct. The uh, code of conduct is nice in that it, it pre-resolves certain standard conundrums. 
problems, right? There are certain sorts of problems that any work environment is going to face over and over again. And the idea is that as a community, planners have gotten together and said, look, here is the problem we face. This is the way we as a group think it ought to be resolved. So what a code does for you is it keeps you from having to worry about the ethical issues underlying these problems. It allows you to simply solve them in a pre-formed fashion. There's uniformity in expectations. That is, no matter where you go, you can expect that there is a certain particular way that these issues are going to be handled, and you can set that bar at an appropriate place. Right? It also allows for the community to explicitly state expectations and standards. That is, right, these things aren't forced down upon you from above, that they really are a reflection of the way that the community of planners itself thinks things ought to be done. Now, if these advantages of the code were sufficient, well, I'd still be in my office. There are disadvantages, right? Now, the way a code works, and whether it's a, a code uh, of conduct for a professional organization or whether it's some set of laws that uh, a government on some level enact, the idea is that those laws, those rules, those aspects of the code are set down in order to address common problems that you see in a very particular way. Now, when you move from the abstract, when you move from the everyday to what life is really like, well, life's a lot trickier. Life is complicated, right? Any code that you have will have a finite number of rules listed. What happens when you find that odd situation you weren't expecting? that doesn't fit into a rule? Or what happens when you come across a case where, well, this rule tells me I have to do X, but this other rule says I should do not X. Which one do I obey? What do we do when we find situations that the framers of of either the code or the law weren't antuation in which the code is not clear? Well, what we need to do is understand what we mean here by ethics, right? We have a distinction between what we can call factual statements, right? Things that are descriptive. Steve is wearing pants. Now, this is a webinar. You'll have to take this on faith, but trust me, I am here wearing pants. This is simply a fact of the world. This is descriptive. It describes the way things are. Ethical statements, on the other hand, are prescriptive. They prescribe. They tell us how things ought to be, whether they are that way or not. So when we say it's immoral or it's morally wrong to juggle kittens, right? that's true whether I'm standing here juggling kittens or not, which while I am wearing pants, I am not juggling the kittens. So the idea is that these two statements, while they're both true, are different kinds of sentences. The first kind of sentence describes how the world is. The second describes how the world ought to be. So when we're talking about ethical questions, we're talking about how we think the world ought to be and how we ought to act within it. So this gives rise to the ethical question, right? Descriptive propositions, we just look out there in the world, see whether it's true or false. How do we go about determining which ones of these ethical propositions are actually true? How do I know what makes kitten juggling morally wrong? Well, when you say Steve is wearing pants, we know what we mean by the word pants. We know what we mean by the word Steve, and we know what it means to wear something. We look at the pants, we look at Steve, and is Steve wearing those pants? It's something that we understand each of the terms, and we can determine whether that sentence is true or not. But when we say it's morally wrong to juggle kittens, we know what we mean by kittens. We know what we mean by juggling. What is it that we exactly mean by morally wrong? What do the phrases morally right and morally wrong mean? If we're going to be able to make determinations about the truth or falsity of ethical claims, if we want to answer ethical questions, questions about how we should act, that we need to have a basic understanding of what we mean by the underlying fundamental moral vocabulary. What do we mean by right and wrong? And it turns out that unlike pants, which has a very particular singular meaning, 
if you take it just in the noun sense, not in the verb sense, I suppose one could pant. When we take ethics and we look at the basic moral vocabulary, morally right and morally wrong, it turns out they mean several different things. We have to consider the different parts of an ethical situation. We have to look at who is the person who is acting. We have to look at what it is they're doing. We have to look at the action itself. We have to look at the effects of having done it, the so what, what happens as a result of having taken that action. We have to look at the to whom. We have to look at the person to whom the act is done. Right? So it's not merely the act, it's not merely who does it, but who is it affecting, and then with whom. That is, there will be certain ways in which people connected to you are affected by the things you do. And we have certain special moral obligations to certain kinds of people. So what we want to do now is run through each of these five because associated with each part of the ethical situation is what we'll call a moral system. That is a definition of what we mean by morally right or morally wrong, a way of answering the question, is this morally permissible? Is this morally necessary? Do I have to do it? Or is it morally forbidden? Do I have to avoid doing it? Now when we deal with the who part, what we're looking at is what we call virtue ethics. Okay, virtue ethics deals with what the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle referred to as character. The idea is that we create ourselves through our actions. We are what we do. Right? And the first part of your code, the aspiration is really not setting out principles as it says, what it's setting out is virtues. Right? The idea is what that first part of your code does is really say, this is the sort of character we want to develop amongst planners. These are the sorts of people we want to be. So by acting in a certain way, we hope to embody these notions. Now Aristotle says every being has what he calls a telos, which is the Greek word for an aim, a goal, an end. Everything's developing towards something. And what Aristotle says is that when we act in a morally right fashion, what we're doing is actualizing our potentiality as a human being. We're becoming the people we want to be, right? So just as within an acorn, right, there is the oak tree that it's striving to become. Similarly, within all human beings, there is this end goal, the perfect human being who does everything absolutely right. My mother-in-law, don't tell her I said that. And the idea is that with each action, with each thing we do, when we act in a morally proper fashion, we're developing our character. We're developing ourselves in a way that we will naturally act properly. We're actualizing ourselves as the full human beings we could do. Now, the question then is, well, how do you actualize that? And according to Aristotle, what you need to do is find the mean, right? The middle path, moderation, he argues, is always proper. You, you don't want to be cowardly. You don't want to be foolhardy. It's right in the middle. You want to be brave. You don't want to be miserly. You don't want to be loose with your money. You want to be in the middle, generous. Now, contemporary virtue ethicists have pointed out, well, there are clearly certain cases where this rule of the mean doesn't work, right? Should I never cheat on my wife? Should I cheat on my wife with everyone? No, just with half of the people you meet. Well, clearly that doesn't work. So the idea here is to move back to this notion of telos, to this notion of goal, aspirations, as your code sets them out, and say, well, if this is the perfect me, what would I need to do to be more like that? And when you face a moral problem, when you face one of those tough conundrums where I just don't know what to do, what you do is you sit down and think, well, what would the perfect me do? If I wanted to be the person that I could say to my kids, look, this is the model of how I want you to be, how would that person act? And in doing so, you would then be actualizing your potential. You would be acting virtuously. So under the virtue ethics picture, moral rightness and wrongness, is a matter of actualizing the best moral person you could envision yourself being. So in certain ways, it's all about you. But of course, it doesn't end there. If it did, philosophers would be out of work, and that would be a very bad thing, trust me. 
what we find around the 17th century is a turn where instead of looking at the agent, the actor, the person who's acting, we turn and we look at the act itself. We look at what we call deontological ethics or an ethics of duty. Now here the idea is that ethics is much more code-like, that ethics comes as a result of having absolute rules. Immanuel Kant, who was the philosopher who really put this view forward, says, look, you can think of somebody who is extremely virtuous, who follows the mean, who embodies all of the, the sort of properties we want in a human being, right, who is very smart, who's calm under pressure, who, you know, acts in a way that is the most efficacious. But if that person has an ill will, if that person wants to do harm, then those virtues don't make that person better. That those virtues make the person worse. Think about the most evil villains we have in literature, right? They're always the ones who, in certain sense, embody the actual virtues, but they use it for evil. So what Kant says is, we can't look at the person who's acting. We need to look at what they do. We need to look at the rules we need to follow. And for Kant, these rules are absolute. That is, the moral rightness or wrongness of something is not in what it does to me, it's not what it does to someone else, it is in the act itself. So the pants that I said I was wearing are black, right? So where is the blackness of my pants? It's a property of the pants themselves. It's implicit to the pants. In the same way Kant wants to say stealing is immoral, not because of what it does, not because of what it does to you, not because of what it does to the person you've stolen it from, not because of what it does to society, but that stealing is implicitly wrong, that the act of stealing itself is morally problematic. And so we have absolute duties, moral rules that we must follow to the letter always. Do not lie. It doesn't matter what you're lying about. You don't do it. So the question then is, where do these rules come from? Now, one of the problems, and this is the problem I pointed out with the code earlier, is that we face a potentially infinite number of possible situations we'll have to deal with. Well, if the number of situations is potentially infinite, then the number of rules we need to know is potentially infinite. But nobody could know that many rules, therefore we couldn't expect anyone to act morally. Kant solves this problem by saying, okay, we can't know all of the rules, but what we can have is a machine a rule that generates the other rules, right? The hardest working rule in show business, right? This is the rule from which all other rules spring, and it's what he called the categorical imperative. And the idea here is that we should always act so that the maxim that our action obeys should be a universal principle. That is, what you do is you take a look at the action. You take away who does it, you take away where they do it, why they do it, to whom they do it, take away every aspect of the context, get it just down to the act itself. Now ask which one should be the universal rule. Always do it, never do it. So I need to decide whether I should lie to my wife when she asks me whether these pants make certain parts of her look larger. Well, what I need to do. I need to strip out the fact that it's my wife. I need to eliminate the fact that I don't have a comfortable couch. I need to eliminate all of these other aspects and get it just down to the element itself. What is it? It's lying. Right? And what should be the rule? Always lie, never lie. Ah, the universal rule is never lie, so you tell the truth regardless of what the consequences are. Right? This is not about consequences. This is not about effects. This is about the act itself, implicit within the act, is the rightness or wrongness that we're trying to determine. Well, never lie. You know, my wife, I threw her a surprise party. In order to get her to the surprise party, I had to tell her that I had accidentally left my jacket over her sister's house. We just had to stop on the way out to dinner and pick it up. It was a lie. I hadn't left my jacket there. I had left many of her friends there, right? Was that wrong? Well, Kant would say yes, but utilitarians would say no, right? The utilitarians say, look, every time you act, you change the world. Your actions make the world a different place. Now, that place could be a better place or it could be a worse place. 
What morality ought to do is lead you to act in such a way that your actions create the best overall circumstances. That is, the greatest ple uh, balance of pleasure over pain, the greatest balance of good consequences over bad consequences. So in this case, a utilitarian would say, don't listen to Kant. Tell your wife whatever you need to to get her to that surprise party because she's going to love that surprise party. Right? Clearly, you're doing it for a good reason. Right? So are there good lies or are there bad lies? Well, it depends upon what it is that the lie is doing. Right? All of our actions exist within a context. All of our actions exist in a world that will be different from the way we acted. And what we need to do, the utilitarian argues, is consider how it affects absolutely everyone. This is a very democratic way of thinking about ethics. Everybody's results are considered equally, are weighed equally. It's only the overall that determines. So no one is given special moral privileges. No one is considered more morally important than anyone else. If I act in this way, what will I be doing to the world as a whole? I need to consider the effects on everybody, and I need to make my determination how to act based on a determination of what makes the world overall a better place for those who live in it. But we also need to think about the to whom. Right? Suppose you come home this evening. You walk in from work, you open your door, you walk in, and you find your TV is gone, and your computer, and your DVD. Everything is gone from your home. In a panic, you run into the kitchen, and there on your refrigerator, under a Save the Children's magnet that was not there when you left, is a handwritten note saying, thank you for your, in quotation marks, donation. We have sold all of your stuff, and we have used it to open a health clinic in sub-Saharan Africa. It's now doing a lot more good than it had been before. Sincerely, Sally Struthers and Bono. Now, clearly all of the money you spent acquiring all of those things is now making the world a much better place than it had been before. But are you right to be angry? Yeah, you are. Right? You will say something like, they had no right to take what they took. So another notion of ethics that we need to deal with is this concept of rights. And rights deal with the people to whom the action is taken. Now the notion of rights is historically one of the most important philosophical notions that are out there. Philosophers, you know, we have a, a reputation of just being up in the clouds, not really making much of a difference. But the notion of rights really is one place where history itself has changed. Notions of human rights, of women's rights, right, has really changed how we look at the world, how we look at other people, and how we write our laws, how we organize our society. So the notion of rights has done tremendous heavy lifting in making the world a better place. But it's actually, when you look at it philosophically, it's an incredibly weak notion. That is, the concept of a right doesn't tell me what I have to do. It's inherently prohibitive. It tells me what I can't do to you. Right? So, you know, the, the, the famous claim that, you know, the right to swing my fist ends at my neighbor's nose. Right? The idea is that I'm free to do with my fist whatever I want until it impinges upon the rights of someone else. But now, this, while it seems like you know, such an incredibly strong notion, it's actually, when you look at it, a lot weaker than you would think. Suppose you're walking down the street and you have a great idea. You gotta write it down or else you know you're gonna forget it. You don't have anything on you, and you're walking past a yard sale. And there in the yard sale, somebody is selling an old spiral notebook for a nickel. Perfect. Buy the notebook, you write down the idea, you take it home. At home, when you're looking for that brilliant idea, you turn through the pages, and there on one page is this weird symbol. It's, it's short little lines connecting letters and numbers are written as subscripts, and that's just strange. You're brother-in-law sees it and says, that's, that's a symbol for a chemical. 
I mean, I have no idea what it is. I mean, I've, I could I could take it into work. You know, some of the guys there may be able to figure it out. I wonder what that is. So they say, all right, let's let's get it checked out. Then they see what it is, and the people at your brother-in-law's office realize, oh my goodness, this is it. This is the cure to the common cold. It's a cure to cancer. It's a cure to AIDS, nail powder, and baldness. All of the horrible evils affecting all of humanity. This is it. Now, whose is it? Well, that symbol is on a sheet of paper that came out of your notebook. You own it. It's yours. Do you have to give it to medical science? No. It's yours. You could do it. You could sell it for a lot of money. You could hang out outside of oncology wards and say to people, bet you wish you had this. Now, that would make you a jerk. Yeah, it would. But under a rights-based ethic, is it immoral? No, because you have acquired the property rights to that thing by purchasing the notebook. It is yours. So a rights-based ethic will not tell you what you have to do. It will only tell you what you can't. So this notion of rights, while it is historically an incredibly powerful notion, it's not going to do all of the heavy lifting for us. Now, one last element to our moral deliberation. And this really comes out of work that was done by feminist thinkers in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, is to incorporate the notion of care. Right? If you think of all of the earlier versions of ethics that we've been talking about, notions of rights or notions of rules, right? these seem very contractual, the sort of thing that you might see if you were a lawyer. When you look at utilitarianism, it seems very much like ethical accounting. Right? Tally up all the positive consequences, tally up all the negative consequences, right? see whether your moral debits are better than your moral credits. Right? All of these pictures of ethics seem to be modeled on the sorts of reasoning that we find in the workplace that is traditionally associated with the work done by men. Carol Gilligan was a psychologist who realized that there are very different forms of relating. One way that we can relate with each other is contractually. Think about what a contract is. A contract is when two people agree, I will do this for you, you do this for me, we shake hands on it, we sign a piece of paper, and then what happens? You do your part, and now I am obligated to do my part. The minute I do my part, what I've done is I've actually freed myself from the contract. I've freed myself from the relationship. Once I've done what I agreed to do, I no longer have any debt, any obligation to you. I am now out of the relationship. Right? That's a contractual relationship. Acting frees you from the relationship. Now, maybe we'll go and contract with each other again if I thought your services were good. Maybe I won't. It's purely up to me. Right? I'm no longer bound to you in any sort of way. That's very different from the sorts of relationships we find in traditionally female-based work, either in the home or in the workplace, things like nursing or teaching. Right? A teacher cares about his or her students, right? And the idea is my job as a teacher when I'm in the classroom is not merely to cover certain topics because that's the contract I have with the students. My job is to figure out how I can improve them as people, how I can get them to be more critical in their thought, how I can get them to be more insightful in the way they approach problems. My relationship with them isn't contractual, it's a care-based relationship. And in a care-based relationship, when you act, you don't free yourself from the relationship, you actually more deeply embed yourself in the relationship. A care-based relationship, unlike a contractual, is based on the welfare of the other person. I enter into a contract because it's advantageous to me. I enter into a care-based relationship because I'm concerned about that other person and want that person's life to be as good as it could be. So Gilligan says there are two very different ways to act contractually and in a care-based fashion. And typically, when we look at the history of ethics, the sorts of things we've just talked about, what you really see is a very contractual picture. That is, there are certain rules that I must follow certain ways I can expect you to act in my presence, as opposed to a care-based relationship where I can expect certain things from you. Now, 
the foundations of this notion is the idea of a relationship, right? Relationships can be strengthened or weakened based upon how we act, right? When somebody acts in a way that does something very kind and caring for you, you think, oh, okay, this person's really a good friend. This is somebody I really can depend on. And when that happens, notice what happens. The relationship itself becomes stronger. The bond becomes tighter. On the other hand, when a person acts in a way that's problematic, in a way that you weren't expecting, you know, like, I really thought I could, I could depend on this person, what happens? Now you've alienated yourself from the other person. You've broken those bonds, right? So in a care-based ethic, an act is morally good if it strengthens the relationships with, uh, that you find yourself within. So an act is morally good on a care-based picture if it strengthens interpersonal relationships. That means that there will be certain relationships that will take moral weight and place it above other relationships. So, you know, the, the, the standard sort of utilitarian picture is, okay, you're at a swimming pool. On one end of the swimming pool, two children are drowning. On the far end, only one child is drowning. Which end do you go to? You can only make it to one in time. And the utilitarian would say, well, of course you go to the one with two children as opposed to one. You double the number of children you save. The care-based ethicist says, okay, let's put a twist here. Suppose the one child on the far end is your child. Well, we would certainly not fault a parent for rushing to save the life of their child, even if it meant these other two strangers would have to suffer as a result. So there's a special weight that we give to care-based relationships, right? If I'm driving down the road and it's a, a cold, rainy night and I'm on a back road and I see somebody whose car broke down and you know I, I, I just I'm late for a meeting I have to get there and I realize the person doesn't have a cell phone you know I'll drive by and I'll say boy I hope somebody else comes by you know I, I really wish I could pick you up sorry and I'll feel some pang of guilt as I drive by but if I'm driving down that street and that's my mother on the side of the road and I drive by and don't stop to help yeah, that's a special level of nasty, right? The idea is that relationships, care-based relationships, bring with them a certain moral weight. So one of the things we need to consider in our ethical deliberations is the people with whom we share these special relationships. So we've seen five very different approaches, right? On the one hand, if I want to ask, is this morally right or not? Well, does it make my character better or not? Does it allow me to actualize the potential of being the perfect me? Well, or, or do I need to basically break it down to the rule? Always do it, never do it. Is it implicit in the action? Or is it in the world? Right? Is it the results of what I do? Is that how I do it? Or do, do I need to consider the person to whom I'm doing it? Is this within their rights or not? Does it violate somebody's rights? Or do I have to think, well, look, okay, is this going to deepen my relationship with this person or with somebody else I know? Which one of these is right? You've given me five very different ways of considering how to judge a moral situation. Which one's right? Well, the answer is yes. When we think about ethical issues, what we really do is consider all five of these, right? Now, when you have five separate criteria, the obvious problem is, what if they don't agree? What if they tell me to do different things? Now, in the overwhelming majority of cases, this isn't a problem. Usually, they all point you in the same direction. So, I'm um, on you know, a busy street and I see a, an elderly person with very heavy bags and I know the cars drive by very quickly. Should I help this person to the other side with the bags? Well, if I look from the virtue ethic standpoint, you know, the perfect me would certainly be caring enough to help, right? That's thoughtful. That's certainly a virtue, right? Well, Always help, never help. Well, always help clearly is the rule, so that one leads me that way. Utilitarian, well, it's not going to cost me much of anything. I was crossing the road anyway, and it clearly makes life better for this person, so it makes the world a better place. That says yes. Well, it's clearly not violating anybody's rights to help them do something they wanted to do anyway, and it would certainly allow me to, at least in this 
small way, interact and create a care-based relationship with this person, you know, a person who was on his or her own. So all of them point in the same direction. And in the majority of cases, that's going to be how it works, that all five of these different aspects of the ethical situation will point you in the same direction. But what about our hard ethical questions? What about the ones that seem like they'll never go away? It seems like there's no good answer to them. When you analyze them, when you think hard about them, what you will actually find underneath them is a debate between ways of moral deliberation, between ways of thinking about ethics. That is, you'll find, oh, is this a matter of rights or is this a matter of utility, right? Well, should we seize property by eminent domain if it means creating a, a better environment for the larger community? Well, it clearly violates the individual owner's rights, but from a utilitarian standpoint, it clearly makes the world a better place. And so what you find in arguments like that one or any of the other many, many ethical issues that seem to plague us and never go away are different ethical systems leading you in the different directions. So, well, wait a minute, but then is this what they call situational ethics, right? This is one of those horrible, evil boogeymen. Well, yeah, it is, but it should be. Ethical situations matter, right? When I'm trying to decide whether an act is right or wrong, elements of the situation need to be considered. Right? There are times when I need to think in a virtue-based way. There are times when I need to think in a rights-based fashion. There's a time when the utilitarian consequences are just so dire that, you know what, we need to override the rights in this case. Right? So if I walk up to a woman and ask her if she'd like to sleep with me, I mean, it's my wife. Right? The ethical situation matters. Now, does it matter in a way that you think, okay, well, yeah, but... It, it has to matter within a particular way of reasoning. No. The idea here is that if you look, we all reason, every one of us, in all five of these ways. Where we often differ is, in particular situations, which one of those ways ought to take the lead, ought to trump the others. So consider two standard sorts of ethical questions that we often bring up in a philosophical classroom, right? So flag burning. Right? If you look at the argument uh, that says it should be a perfectly legal activity, right, it's often couched by liberals, right, from those on the political left, as a matter of rights. Right? It's purely an issue of speech rights. You know, I have the right to free speech. I, this is a political act. I need to be able to express myself. And on the other hand, right, what you find from conservatives is a care-based argument, right? Well, think of all the people who died for that flag, right? What would it be for them? It's invoking a notion of care, right? And both of these are interesting philosophical positions. And what we need to do in determining whether to make the law or not, whether the law would be moral or not, is to decide which of these factors ought to be privileged. But then if you look at a different issue, something like endangered species. Should landowners be able to do whatever they want with their land if it means cutting down the habitat for an endangered species? Well, those from the left now make a care-based argument, right? Oh, but think about the spotted owl. Think about what it means. On the other hand, the conservatives are now making a rights-based argument. Well, look, this is about landowner rights. This is about what an individual can do with land that he or she owns. So they flip-flop which in contemporary political terms is a bad thing, but in philosophical terms is a realistic thing. The idea here is that ethical problems are hard for a reason, because they're hard. And we do need to think about these things in all five of these ways, because in certain situations, the hard situations, they're going to point you in different directions. And what we need to decide individually and as a society is which of those decide, in this case, how we ought to act. So does this give us an answer to every ethical question? Is there a clear way of saying this is what you morally must do? Well, no. 
but it at least begins to give us a framework within which we can have civil, intelligent discussions about hard questions. And that, in the end, really is the best we can hope for. Hard questions are hard for a reason, because they're hard. But what we need to do is have open-minded, thoughtful discussions about them. And when we realize that there are ways of thinking about these ethical questions, when you come across situations that you find that are not in your code of conduct, but clearly have effects on the community and on individuals within that community, you need to be able to think. You need to use, as Susan said earlier, your judgment. But that judgment isn't random. It's not just shooting from the hip. It's just not coming from the gut. It needs to come from the head. And hopefully what we've given you in the last little bit is a way to think more clearly and more rationally about those hard ethical questions that may not have easy answers within the code of conduct. Let me give you back to Susan. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we did get one question in that I am going to go ahead and address right now. William asked us if anyone has lost their AICP, and if so, why? And I can tell you that people have lost their AICP, um, definitely more than one. And why? I can't really answer. Um, basically, I can tell you for a violation of the code, a serious violation of the code, um, but APA does not publish those type of details. Um, with the new revision to the code, the 2009, the serious crime, um, APA did add into the code that it would be published if someone basically fell under that rule. Um, if someone is violating some other portion of the code, however, APA doesn't go into specifics. They do each year do a report, and you can find this on the website, um, the APA website. I think you go under um, the AICP heading and the ethics heading under that, and you can look up the reports for each different year. And I don't have that in front of me at the moment, but I can tell you that um, the numbers are not high. I mean, in the past uh, 10 years or so, every year there's been maybe between 5 and 12 um, investigations that have been of a serious nature. Um, some people have lost their AICP, some people have the charge has just been dismissed, um, various things like that. But um, I do want to add in one thing that the code is very clear about. When you have started down that process, and this is laid out very specifically in Part C, which is the procedures. If you're being investigated, um, you basically can't back out of that. Um, they will investigate and they will come to some sort of conclusion. They will sanction you or not sanction you. If you decide that you're not going to renew that year, perhaps, to try and avoid something, that's not a way you can get out of this. Essentially, you can go away and lose your AICP, but if you try to come back in, they basically will restart the investigative process. Um, so I just want to make everyone aware of that. When, when, you've, when you have been charged with something and they're investigating that charge, um, it's not a process that you can opt out of and maintain your AICP. Okay, we are oh, one past. We're going to do our polls now. Um, and the first one we're going to do is for scenario A. Wow, I'm jumping ahead here. Scenario A. This one, I'm going to go ahead and, and give you time to look at this screen and actually read this out loud for you. Um, the question is at the bottom, and once I've given you some time to look at this page, I will go ahead and launch the poll and you'll be able to respond. The Local Emergency Management Task Force, which includes members of the fire department, local government officials, and local government planners, is offered a tour of a Marcella Shale drilling facility, um, including a site currently being drilled and a site in operation by a company working in the area. Um, this is an issue, you know, in this instance it's Marcella Shale. Um, it could be something different. Essentially, though, an activity that's having a land use impact that is a new issue for your area. Someone is offering a tour so people can learn more about it. 
these are locations where access is typically restricted. You can't um, go up to their front gate and knock and say, can I have a look around? I don't really understand how these things work. Um, it is typically restricted. So the fact that there's a tour and an opportunity to learn something is um, different. The purpose is to familiarize the task force members with the operations for purposes of emergency management planning. Transportation by bus tour and a box lunch are provided. You are an AICP local government planner serving on the task force and the company which is offering the tour has been before your community's planning commission on a variety of issues related to their drilling operations. What is your best course of action regarding the tour? A is going to be decline, B is going to be attend and take part in all activities, C is attend but decline the box lunch and reimburse for the bus tour. Let me bring up the poll here. And we'll give about 30 seconds for everyone to answer that question. Again, we're asking for your best course of action regarding the tour. Of course, with respect to the code of conduct, A being decline, B is attend and take part in all activities, and C is attend but decline the box lunch and reimburse for the bus tour. We'll give a few more seconds. It seems like a fair amount of people are still answering, so we'll wait a little bit before we close the poll. All right. I, I think most people who have who are taking part have taken part at this point. So we're going to close this poll, and then we have a scenario B that we're going to go ahead and poll on that. Scenario B, Planner A, who is the director of planning for a large municipality and an AICP, retires. Prior to their retirement, there was discussion of an upcoming project within the municipality, but details were not determined. Planner A is now employed with a consulting firm. Their former municipality has put out an RFP for the project that was in general discussion during their tenure at the municipality. As part of their new job, Planner A is to respond to the RFP for their new firm. The question in this case, is responding to the RFP a conflict in the eyes of the Code of Ethics? A is going to be yes, with the rules of conduct and with the aspirational principles. B, not with the rules, maybe with the aspirational principles, and C is no. I'm going to launch this poll for everyone to respond to. The poll is open now. We'll give about a minute for people to respond to this one. In both of these cases, you know, what you have in, in front of you, the information is what you should be responding to. We will discuss um, different nuances to things as part of um, the discussion. Again, A is yes with the rules of conduct and the aspirational principles, B not with the rules, maybe with the aspirational principles, and C is no.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and close this poll. All right. I'm going to flash up the poll results for both of these so everybody can see how the entire audience responded. We're going to go back to A first. For scenario A, your best course of action regarding the Marcellus Shale tour. In the audience, 11% thought it would be best to decline to take part in the tour. 37% said attend and take part in all activities. And 52% said attend but decline the box lunch and reimburse for the tour. All right, let me give you a little bit of background on the code specifically with these. The parts of the code that you would be thinking about with this, um, in aspirational principles, the one that says you should avoid a conflict of interest or even the appearance of a conflict of interest, um, the one that says we should continue to enhance our professional education, um, in the rules of conduct, we shall not, as public officials, accept compensation. And then B8, we shall not, as public officials, engage in any private communications as prohibited by law or agency rules, procedures, or custom. So I would say that your best option here is C, really, to do the tour, but to decline the box lunch and reimburse, reimburse for the bus. Um, and this is based on exactly how the scenario is written. Obviously, there are some things that could change. Um, in regards to conflict of interest, this group has appeared before the Planning Commission, so that could potentially be seen as a conflict of interest. However, if this is an area where, as a planner, you're not familiar with something and you need to go see this facility and you need to go see how it works, um, this is part of continuing your professional education. So those are two aspirational principles there that are somewhat in conflict. What I would say, though, is um, the conflict of interest part, you need to be open. It needs to be known in advance that you're going to go on this tour, um, you need to ask permission from your supervisor, um, and it just needs to be an open decision that you'll be attending for the educational value of it. Um, in regards to, to B5 and B8, uh, the compensation point to avoid any issues, um, I would definitely just decline the lunch and you know work out something with the bus tour or perhaps drive your own transportation um, whatever you feel comfortable with or what your agency feels comfortable with. AICP in itself, the code, um, they are not worried about the nominal value of something like a box lunch, um, but your agency um, or your code at work may be worried about that, so definitely be checking on that. And then this is more dependent on the situation and what what you know specifically of this company or these people or how things have gone in your community, which obviously you, that wasn't part of the written scenario that you could respond to. Um, but yeah, if, if the company during the tour kind of wants to walk up to you and talk about, you know, driveway permit that they're going to be going after next week, that's not a discussion that you can be having. That would be a private communication, um, something that should be happening in a meeting in front of your planning commission, not on this side tour. So that's something you need to stay away from. And if you have a situation where you think that type of thing may definitely be happening, then you probably should decline. Um, but scenario A, as it was written, um, that really wouldn't um, 
you wouldn't know that from the written part of it. So um, the best option, again, C, do the tour, decline the box lunch, reimburse for the bus tour, take your own transportation, or something of that nature. Um, Steve, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. I'll let Steve have a, a take on that one as well. Concerns about conflict of interest are essential, and notice that it is an actual conflict of interest, but even the appearance of a conflict of interest that is the concern here, because with an appearance of a conflict of interest, whether you actually feel yourself to have been influenced or not, the larger community's faith in your ability to do your job well is, is what really is at issue. Now, when the company sets up the tour, Clearly, they are going to be setting it up to be taking you certain places, to be showing you certain things, led by a person who will be telling you certain things. And there is no doubt in anyone's mind that this is advertising, that this is, in a certain sense, a sales job as much as it is professional education. So if there are other ways that you could get that information, perhaps those ways would be better. But if it is something that you need to see in person, need something where you really do need to be present, right? Making these other gestures, as small as they may be, right, are imperative in order to assure those outside that you are coming in in an educational fashion. That is, you're coming in with an open mind and thinking about this in a critical fashion. So avoiding even the appearance of a conflict of interest is essential especially when there is concern that the information you're getting is clearly going to be designed to convince you in certain ways. All right, we're going to share the results for scenario B, which was the retired planner. in the RFP process. Um, the audience felt that I think it was 47 um, percent, it would be a conflict with the rules of conduct and the aspirational principles. 37 uh, percent not with the rules, maybe with the aspirational principles, and 15 percent said no. You might be a little surprised by my take on this. Um, my take would be that, with the way this was specifically worded, anyway, um, that it's not a conflict. Obviously, this is very case by case and very specific. Um, generally, the code does not want to punish someone for moving from public to private. They don't want to punish someone for using their skills and experience. Uh, they do, however, want things to be open, and they do want someone to be following the rules. Um, so, for example, if the agency did have um, a rule about a separation time between when you retire from the public sector and when you can move into the private sector and come back and, and go after things, then that clearly would have an impact, and you need to be following that particular rule. Um, the conflict of interest, those are aspirational principles, um, that A2C one, avoiding the conflict of interest or the appearance. This would have to be very open. Um, and the conflict of interest with, again, as the scenario was written, this person heard about this project that was going to be the upcoming. Um, they weren't a detailed part of putting it together. Um, so in this case, I would say that's not a conflict. If, however, when they were at the public agency, they had been part of putting this RFP together, again, that's, that's different, um, and that would change things. But, you know, in every single job, you hear about all sorts of things going on, and if you were prevented from ever having input on a project that you had heard about once at your job, there wouldn't be much left for you to do in the world. <laughs> um, so there is definitely a line there, and you have to look at um, 
the level of detail that was gone into ahead of time and how open things are, and again, the, the agency rules. Um, B9, which is a rule, the private discussions with decision makers um, as prohibited by law or agency rules, procedures, or custom. Um, the way it was written up, you know, there is no, there's nothing that you can read in scenario B that would say that this planner um, had talked with his coworkers and said, hey, I'm going to go out to the private sector, like, are you going to give me this job? Um, the scenario didn't say that, so you have to assume that it did not happen. Um, if that did happen, well, then, yeah, they shouldn't be, that's, you know, a violation of the rules. That's under B13. Um, or, in, and this is um, not in the scenario itself, but, a, again, a, a changing of things. If you change what had been written up there, um, if this planner had gone to the private sector looking for jobs and said, you know, you hire me and I can get you this job that's going to come out, out of my agency in the next few months, um, that would be a violation of the code. So it's very case by case. Um, if there's prior discussion, some type of gentleman's agreement between the ASAP and the private sector ahead of time, that's a problem. Um, if there was a department policy about separation that was not followed, that's a problem. Um, and if the AICP had been heavily involved in the development of the RFP prior to their retirement, that would also be a problem. Um, as the scenario was written, though, none of those things were something that you could tell had happened. And as I said before, you know, the code understands and APA understands that people move from the public to the private sector. They want it to be open. They want you to be following agency rules. They want you to be following the code, um, but they're not going to deny you the ability to use your skills and experience from the public sector out in the private sector. Uh, we had a question from Henrietta that I thought the code prohibited people from working with companies that you had had dealings with. Um, the code does not speak to that specifically now. I believe one of the earlier versions of it was more detailed with that, but now they basically leave it up to the agency to have some sort of detail about that time period separation. There is a rule in the code, however, that gets into um, a position that you may have taken. You cannot work in the public sector and have a position on a, pri on a project, go to the private sector, and then change your position and start trying to advance that position. That's a problem with the code of conduct. That is not um, something that APA wants you to be doing. Again, that goes back somewhat to the independent professional judgment. They want your decisions at the po public agency to be very similar to what your decisions are going to be in the private sector. So the code does address that. Um, but in terms of a time period separation, they leave that to, to the, the local agency. Um, Sandra had a question about what the definition of serious crime is, and that is defined in Section D of the code now, and it is very specific about the types of things um, that you are convicted of. Um, I don't have that detail in front of me, but it is Section D of the code that defines serious crime. Um, Gunnar asked if there's still a one-year waiting period to work with former municipalities, and again, no. That's the one where you have to check with your local um, agency and see what the time separation is. The code does not speak to that. It speaks more to the type of positions that you have as a planner. No, we seem to be getting several questions coming in, you know, is there a two-year revolving door rule? And, and there are no, no time periods specified in the code at this point. Um, I believe the, the version that was prior to 2005 did have something more along those lines, but there's not anything like that at this point. I will say that 
um, you definitely need to check what your agency has or what your state has. In Pennsylvania, we have the Sunshine Act, we have a right to know law, and those are the types of things that the AICP code is referring to when it says agency or law um, locally. And that is basically they are deferring to your state, to your municipality, to your public agency, whatever it is. You need to be following those rules in addition to whatever the AICP code notes. Um, while we're checking for some more questions from anyone, I do want to provide you with some other resources. Carol Barrett has a book which is from 2001, which is getting a little dated at this point, um, but it's called Everyday Ethics for Practicing Planners. Um, one thing to be aware of if you do want to go out and get this book or borrow it from your library is that it is under the old code. Um, so you need to be aware of that, so some specifics are not going to apply. But it is very thorough discussions of a lot of different scenarios. And she goes through and essentially presents, here's a situation, here are some things that you could do. If the situation were to change like this, this is what you should do instead. Um, and so she goes through all those different nuances and for many different scenarios. And so it's still quite useful despite the fact that it's under the old, old code. Um, the APA website is also very useful with this, of course, um, under their ethics heading. Number one, you can get the contact information for the ethics officer uh, if you ever need informal or formal advice. Again, the informal advice, um, it's not written. It's not necessarily binding on anyone but it's meant to be just what it says, informal. If you're just kind of looking the officer can provide that for you, and if there were to be some problem later down the line, you could say, you know, I did seek advice, and this is what I was told. The formal advice is, again, much more formal, as the name implies. They want things in writing, and then they will respond in writing, and then they will publish that written um, advice that is given out with specifics taken out of the information so that it's not anyone's name or exact position or anything of that nature, but it will be out of what the direction was from APA. Um, so those are two resources out there for you, and I will say if you look up the ethics report online, which talks about how many people may have been suspended or sanctioned in some other manner. Um, it also tells you how many people have sought informal or formal advice, and the numbers are quite low, which I find to be somewhat surprising that very, very few of us um, ask for advice on this issue, at least to APA. Um, if you are not an AICP, officially, of course, you don't have to follow the AICP code of conduct, but um, it's a good starting point anyway, but there's also the ethical principles in planning, which APA developed for non-AICPs to follow, um, which deals a lot with public process and, and that type of issue. And the toolkit for conducting ethics sessions, that's something that APA just did in the past few years for people who are running CM sessions like this. Um, you know, it's for that purpose but it's useful because in the back of it they have about 30 different scenarios that are listed out and what the APA positions are on them. So that's just an interesting read um, for all those different types of scenarios that are discussed and what, um, what APA thinks the proper answer is essentially. So those are some resources out there for you. We have uh, some questions, some discussion referring back to, I guess, what would be scenario B, the retired planner. Um, Scott noted that he would assume, given an existence of open government, sunshine laws, etc., that the general public had just as much access to the subject as the RFP as did Planner A. What would interest me more is if planners, 
Planner A's contributions and suggestions to the RFP played toward the strengths of the private firm. Would it be appropriate to have Planner A filter his or her input such that the majority of the firms in the area could provide the services required by the RFP? Um, that is definitely something. If Planner A had detailed input into the RFP that did direct it to particular firms, you know, if it was more um, driven to a public involvement firm and he was going to a firm that was very strong in public involvement, yeah, that's a problem. Um, and that's something that, again, that level of input into the RFP um, would be a problem, essentially. Dan had a question. Again, I think we're still um, with scenario B here. If the planner lost his or her job due to budget cuts in the public sector, the job opened up in the private sector, um, they get the new job with the expect expectation they will bring in work, um, obviously. That's what private firms want people to do, for sure. Um, the planner has a family to feed and take care of. Is knowing that the planner can help bring in this new F RFP work um, and the impacts obviously on them personally. Um, again, that's where I, you know, APA understands that people move from the public sector into the private sector. They don't want to deny someone the ability to use those skills. Um, it's expected that you're going to have a level of knowledge from working in the private sector and that is what, or you have a level of knowledge from the public sector and that is what the private sector wants from you. Um, they do expect you to bring in work. You know, your network of contacts and things of that nature um, you know, where it would start being a problem is if like gentlemen's agreements and things like this, oh, I can absolutely win you this job, you know, you give me this job dependent on me getting this job because my old friend at my old department says I'll absolutely getting, get it, um, that's where there's an issue with the code of conduct. Someone's just asking where the code is. It is on the APA website. Um, there is an ethics heading and it's available um, under that. It is in PDF form. You can download it. Like I said, it's about eight pages or so. Um, so it's not all that long. I'm going to bring up um, a contact slide for myself and for Steve Gimbel. If you have questions that we don't get to today um, or something that you think of later, essentially, um, you can contact us. Another question here. This is from Jill. I've been concerned about the fact that the developers seem to have their actions kept confidential while they are scoping out a major project that may have substantial impacts on a neighborhood while the residents are kept in the dark until the official public meetings and until the wheels are greased by the developer. Any comments? Um, overall, I would say one of the things that APA stresses um, in the Code of Conduct and essentially in every publication that they put out is that public involvement is a critical part of planning and it should be early in the process. Um, Essentially, you can, it's impossible to, to do too much public involvement and you need to be reaching out to people in a variety of formats these days in particular. Um, APA in, in all instances, I would say, in the code itself, defers to more public involvement, more opportunity and earlier in the process at all times. And that's something specifically to speak to um, web-based um, outreach these days. That's a fabulous thing. Um, you can bring in a new audience that way, but communities definitely need to, number one, still be doing other forms of outreach that get to people beyond the internet and also um, making sure if they do web-based outreach that it's 
accurate information. One thing I've seen a lot of that um, drives me a little crazy personally, I have to say, is that when there's a website for something and then it's out of date or it's inaccurate information, um, that's not doing good public outreach. Just having a website is not useful if the information on it is wrong. All right, I think we've covered most of our questions right now at this point. I want to thank Dr. Steve Gimble for joining us today. We will be checking over any questions that we did not get to and covering those um, after the fact if that's possible. Again, as Cody said, um, this is one and a half CM credits and it does cover the ethics credits that are required through that process. Um, thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Um, one second, I'm getting my slides back up. So, um, yes, thank you, Susan and Stephen, and also um, you, Sarah, for taking care of the questions. Um, for those of you that are still in attendance, um, I would just like to go over on logging CM credits again. Um, like Susan was just saying, it is available for one and a half um, ethics credits. And so... Um, you can go to www.planning.org slash CM, select activities by date, and then underneath uh, Friday, April 8th, um, you'll find ethics, a framework for decision making. And this is up already, so as soon as you're done, you can go claim those. Uh, well, I'm off, I think. And then we are also recording today's session, so you'll be able to find a PDF and a video recording of today's webinar at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive and like I said this should be up by Monday. Um, this does conclude today's session so I just want to thank you and have a good day.